Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the 2022 World Hospice and Palliative Care Day special lecture. My name is Chris Klinger and on behalf of the sponsoring organizations, the National Initiative of the, of the Elderly, Pallium Canada and the Institute for Life, Course and Aging, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the World Hospice and Palliative Care Day special lecture that is entitled Healing Hearts and Communities this year. World Hospice and Palliative Care Day is an international day of action geared to foster global hospice and palliative care movements. The theme of this year's talk, Healing Hearts and Communities, is very much connected to what we see in the world right now, as we are steering to what we hope is a post-pandemic world. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the land from which I'm speaking today, the city of Toronto, which is situated as the traditional territory of many First Nations, including the Nississaugas of the Credit, and is home to a diverse First Nations community, the Inuit and the Métis people. I'm grateful for the opportunity to work and live on this land and have the opportunity to move forward with us as we do collectively do this work in palliative care and to contribute to the healing journey that we all share together. Over the next 70 minutes or so, you will hear from Jeff Mote, Pallium Canada's Chief Executive Officer, and an update towards the Palliative Care ACHO project. We will also introduce our special lecturer, Professor Alan Kelleher of the University of Vermont and Public Health Palliative Care International. Professor Kelleher's presentation will be followed by a question and answer session facilitated by Dr. Esme Fuller-Thompson, the director of the Institute for Life Course and Aging at the University of Toronto. If you want, you can post your questions in the Q&A section of the platform and feel free to utilize the chat to introduce yourselves, to provide your location, to post comments, and to let us know about any technical issues that might be appearing through this presentation. This session is gonna be recorded and it will be made available everyone via eHospice Canada and Pallium Canada. So thank you very much again for joining us today for the World Hospice and Palliative Care Day special lecture. On behalf of the host organizations, the National Initiative for the Care of the Elderly, Pallium Canada, and the Institute for Life Course and Aging at the University of Toronto. Jeff, I turn it over to you for an update on the Palliative Care ECHO project. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Chris. And it's great to join you today. Again, my name is Jeffrey Mott. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Pallium Canada. And last year at the World Hospice Palliative Care Day special lecture that we hosted, I introduced the Palliative Care ECHO Project, which is a five-year initiative that cultivates communities of practice uh, and establishes continuous professional learning development opportunities for healthcare providers across this country who care for patients with life-limiting illnesses. The Palliative Care ECHO Project is designed to create communities of learners in palliative care by bringing together local healthcare providers and community leaders with regional, provincial, territorial, and national subject matter experts for continuous uh, learning, deep dive discussions, national presentations, and interactive case-based discussions. ECHO uses a hub and spoke education model to connect healthcare providers and communities with teams of specialists and experts at regional and national centers. And the creation of these hubs is the anchor of this overarching model and exists to be more responsive to local, regional, and even provincial, territorial, or sector-specific needs. And I'm happy to report that we now have a total of 10 hub partners, if you want to flip to the next screen, um, within our network, which is four more since uh, when I presented to you a year ago. So we're delighted to have these partners that represent uh, national providers, uh, provincial, territorial, even regional providers here. So we're delighted to, to welcome four more to our family of hub partners. Let's go on to the next uh, screen and talk a little bit about the progress that we've made to date since I last presented to you a year ago. So um, as you can see, uh, the, the graph on the upper right, it's, it's certainly going in the right direction. When you look at the number of ECHO programs that we've held to date, some 142 ECHO sessions have been delivered. This represents about 8,000 uh, learner encounters and a similar number in terms of the number of individuals viewing our session recording. So if they can't attend the live ECHO sessions, they're going to the website to actually view the recording. So if you look at where we started, where we held uh, one session where 
We now then jumped to, to 95 last year and, and some 46 uh, to date, and we're projecting that number to go up to about 160. So a very, very strong growth. We're, we're on target to, to hit our objectives that we set out for ourselves. And to give you a flavor on the next slide of the types of sessions um, that, we are, that we're hosting, um, we've seen, again, a tremendous growth in our programs and the diversity of the sessions that we've held as well. Um, I mean, in our first year, uh, which was only three months, it was uh, launched in Q4, we ran our first ECHO session and, and that really focused, uh, our, our efforts really focused on, um, you know, forming our hub partnerships, uh, developing our scientific committee, mapping out our, our project plan and so on. Uh, but by the end of last fiscal, we had hosted, and this is just Pallium ourselves, some 52 ECHO sessions. Some of these were standalone sessions, uh, but we also started to ramp up our communities of practice and our quality improvement programs. Uh, we also reached a big milestone launching our very first palliative care journal watch series. Uh, we also hosted five echo sessions in support of communities on topics such as uh, developing a culture of compassion within our places of work. Uh, we held two Atlas Care Mac workshops. workshops. Uh, we did a session on the Care Connections Program and one on the Compassionate Community Sustainability Guide. And this demonstrates that the ECHO model extends value beyond serving healthcare professionals to supporting caregivers in our communities. So in addition to these sessions, uh, these Pallium hosted ECHO sessions, our hub partners themselves delivered some 43 ECHO sessions last year and 13 year to date on topics such as psychosocial spiritual care, serious illness conversations, and palliative emergencies in the home, to name just a few. And if you're curious as to how our learners, um, what the learner experiences uh, are for these sessions, as you can see here, um, our, our learners feel that these sessions are, are quite relevant to their practice, that it, uh, it met their learning needs, was a very good learning experience overall. So we're very encouraged uh, by the learner experience to date. And I'll just finish off in the last slide by saying that uh, we're very thrilled to have launched uh, our new website associated with the Palliative Care Echo Project. Um, you can visit the URL echopalliative.com. And this new website really makes it easier for visitors to learn all there is to know about the Palliative Care Echo Project and have easier access to upcoming sessions delivered by Pallium and our hub partners and to access uh, sessions that have already taken place. So I'll leave it there. Um, I am now going to uh, turn our attention to our uh, guest uh, special distinguished uh, lecture uh, for today, uh, Dr. Alan Kelleher. And Professor Alan Kelleher is a clinical professor at the College of Nursing and Health Sciences within the University of Vermont in the U.S. and an adjunct professor within the Department of Family Medicine Division of Palliative Care at McMaster University. Uh, a medical and public health sociologist, he is widely recognized for the introduction and development of health promotion policies and practices for palliative care. His scholarship follows two complementary lines of work, one, interdisciplinary studies investigating human conduct and experiences at the end of life, and two, the application of health promotion policies and practices for the aged in bereavement and within palliative care. His focus is on civic participation and support for end-of-life care through community development, social ecology, service redesign, civic policy development, and public education. His work is foundational for the global compassionate communities and cities movement within hospice palliative care. He's also co-founder and the inaugural president of the Public Health Palliative Care International. That's an international association for practice learning, professional support, and facilitation of local and international communication between members in their individual attempts at embedding a public health approach to the practice of palliative care. Professor Kelleher is as widely published, including on, on health promoting palliative care, and is the co-editor of the new Oxford textbook of public health palliative care, and that's with Julian Abel. His textbook on compassionate cities outlines the historical, political, and conceptual basis of compassionate cities and provides a community development model for end-of-life care. It gives me great pleasure to turn the floor over to Professor Kelleher. Thank you very much for that introduction. That was great. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody, to this uh, talk. Um, today, uh, I am going to give you a rundown on how compassionate communities came about, what they are, how they're spreading, and how they're part of a broader public health approach um, to palliative care as an international movement uh, within our field. Next, please. 
So compassionate communities. Um, this is really about the, the why, what, and how communities act as partners in palliative care. This is the key thing. This is not about uh, volunteers per se. This is about how whole communities, how the civic sector itself takes up its responsibilities for palliative care, how the workplaces and the schools, the universities and the art galleries and the museums and the faith groups and the local government and the neighborhoods all participate in palliative care. It's a social systems model of healthcare at the end of life. It's radically different from the way in which we often think about uh, palliative care, which is a kind of a face-to-face -face clinical enterprise. Um, the people we see in our hospices and the people we see uh, when we're doing home care, people we see in our patients. This is really about um, developing everybody, uh, a cross-section, if you like, of our communities as partners in palliative care. Everybody has a role to play. So compassionate communities is one major way in which this public health approach to palliative care um, expresses itself. Next slide, please. So what's the background? So the public health approach to palliative care is designed to complement the clinical. They go together. The aim was always to rehabilitate the idea of the social, giving the idea of community substance. We've had a long history in palliative care of thinking about the community as a target for palliative care education or even death literacy, being able to um, try to convey to them what we do as palliative care clinicians. It's also a place where we fundraise for example, or a place where we draw our volunteers from. It has never really been an idea of community with its own agency. And so the point of the public health approach to palliative care is to uh, revise our understanding of the social and rehabilitate, if you like, the idea of community as um, an area with its own agency, just like our clinical services. So workplaces and schools and universities, for example, trade unions and neighborhoods do have a role to play. And we're interested in promoting their activities, both in terms of policy and practice in palliative care. So it's social with a big S, if you like, community with a big C. And the reason why we do this is the 95% rule. The 95% rule basically says that dying people and caregivers, people who live with grief and loss, spend less than 5% of their time in front of a doctor or a nurse, clinician of any stripe, really. 95% of the time, people who live with life-limiting illnesses or grief and loss or caregiving are alone or with their family or with their friends, or with their animal companions, or with their stereo system, or with their television, or the internet, or social media. If we're really interested in end of life care, that's where the action is, the 95%. That's what I call the 95% rule. And in palliative care, we have to ask ourselves, what is it we're doing in that 95%? That majority of time when people are not before us uh, as inpatients or outpatients or in home care, what are we doing in that space? And the reason why we want to be in that space has to do with tackling the morbidities and mortalities associated with the social epidemiology of living with a life-limiting illness, caregiving, and living with grief and loss. And surprisingly, the social epidemiology for those three experiences are remarkably similar. Those morbidities are things like anxiety and depression, about social isolation and loneliness, 
about the lost school days, the lost work days, the stigma, the social rejection, and worse, the suicides, the sudden deaths, all of these things are amenable to prevention or harm reduction. If we can't prevent them, we can reduce their impact if we act early. And therefore, early intervention is an important part of the public health approach to, to palliative care. The other thing that we often think about and we often do, and we, don't, and we often do this without thinking, is that our focus primarily in addressing people suffering whilst dying and grieving and the difficulties around caregiving is we see these things as a list of problems. Sometimes palliative care is, is popularly known as comfort care in some countries. It's to bring comfort to the suffering, to ease the suffering, but it is a problem-based gaze. It is a problem-based gaze that is dominant in palliative care. And we forget the well-being side of things often. The growing intimacy and friendships that are made whilst living with a life-limiting illness and caregiving. The transcendent experience is the meaning-making, the storytelling, not just the fear of dying or death, but the courage in facing it. The waiting experiences that allow for reminiscence, wrapping up one's life, putting relationships on a new footing, not letting go, but rechiseling a new way of relating to each other, readdressing the birth of a new relationship for the future, and health, physical health as well, and well being. People who are living with life limiting illnesses are also entitled to thinking that they can feel good too and that they can still enjoy things. Um, and all of these things are important to addressing their suffering. It's not just disease and illness or symptoms that we are concerned about, but it's health and well being. And most of that health and well being are in social relationships. Finally, another reason why we adopt a public health approach to palliative care is for the need to take a population approach to death literacy or death education. We do this in every other area of healthcare. Most of us listening to this uh, podcast at the moment um, take for granted that everyone has a responsibility for their own health. No one, no one seriously believes that healthcare is visiting your clinicians. That hasn't been an idea that's had any currency since the 50s and 60s. Everybody takes responsibility for their own health care today. We exercise, we try to eat right, we wear our bicycle helmets and we wear our seatbelts, we watch our drug and alcohol intake. And the same goes for death, dying and end of life care. Everybody needs to learn what their responsibilities are and how they can help with each other, with all of us in understanding what death, dying, grief, bereavement, caregiving is like in real life. What are the things to watch out for? What are the difficulties? What are the good things that come uh, with those experiences? It's important in terms of moving away from death, dying, and end-of-life care as a horror story to understanding that it is a, an experience like love itself. It has a mixture of good and bad things in it. And we're only by learning more about that are we best equipped to support each other in these difficult experiences. And that's why we do public health. That's why public health approach to palliative care is so important in complementing what we do clinically. Next, please. The methods of a public health approach in palliative care, well, these are those methods there. That's health promotion. It's the idea of moving away from the problem-based gaze and identifying aspects of health and well-being, particularly in social relationships and social experience, and promoting these uh, right across the board. Public education, as I've said earlier, death literacy is very important 
we should learn about death and dying, caregiving, end of life care, grief and bereavement in schools, but also workplaces and in our social media and in our television programming and in our radio shows, in our museums and art galleries. They are a reoccurring, a fundamental experience in life. And so we all benefit by knowing more about these things. Community development, also called compassionate communities. People often talk about compassionate communities away from the technical aspects of what they really are. And compassionate communities are really examples of community development. Some people think of still think of community development as the way in which we um, try to develop aid in developing countries or resource poor countries. But in fact, that's not what community development is. Community development is literally the development of communities to identify their problems and their goals and their solutions. They come together to identify a problem and they come together to identify how they will approach the solutions to that problem. So compassionate neighbours programs, compassionate workplace programs, these are all programs that come together and say, look, we're a setting like every other setting in our community. We have people who die suddenly, people who get sick, suffer from serious life-threatening or life-limiting illnesses. There are people among us who have long-term caregiving responsibilities, either the people at home who have a child with a life-limiting illness or an older parent who's living with dementia. And many of us live with our grief and loss, if not from our past and from a current situation like losing a spouse or a child, even an animal companion. So these are important things to understand that these are reoccurring and they will keep occurring in our workplace, in our school, uh, in our neighborhoods. And what can we do best to support each other in this? Because at the end of the day, we want our supports to be more than professional supports. There are limits to professional servicing. It is better to have a friend or a work colleague or a family member support you and support you regularly throughout your experience than to have a professional intervention. The other thing is population policy. It's really important that we do civic policies that not just in terms of national health policy or state health policies or provincial state uh, provincial policies, but also that workplaces, businesses have their own policies, that schools have their own policies, local government have their own policies. Social ecology is the other one. Social ecology is a little bit different from a community development in the sense that these are approaches that modify the physical and social environment to create what we call compassionate cities. Here we're interested in literally whole cities coming together, the, the city leadership coming together and deciding how they can change the physical and social environments to enhance the supports for people living with life-limiting illnesses and grief and loss and caregiving. Um, there are many compassionate cities uh, growing around the world now. They started after the compassionate communities. They are more difficult to do but we've got quite a lot of them. And those cities work as coalitions, cooperative coalitions between the different sectors, the education sector working with the local government sector, local government sector working with the business sector, and all designed to create a broader environment in which to support people in matters of uh, life and death. Social marketing is the other method that's important. Just as it's important to sell health to promote health and self-responsibility and civic responsibility in health. It's also important to sell the idea of support and meaning making and storytelling uh, in the area of death, dying, loss and caregiving. So social marketing, selling the idea of the, the idea of support, the idea that there are positive and negative things that occur at the end of life. It's not all negative. These things are important selling what kinds of things people can do, 
that are useful, visiting people, um, becoming more informed about the end of life, working in partnership, volunteering, all of those things need to be marketed. So they are essentially the, the basic methods of public health. Many of you will have heard of some of those, I think. Next slide. So where did this come from? Where did this public health compassionate communities ID come from? Well, in it, it comes from several sources. First of all, it comes from systems theory. The idea that uh, effective interventions are not just interventions between individuals, but the social, the broader social environment plays a role. Institutions are responsible for success and failures as well as individuals. Systems are important to understand. Organizations create the basis for failure and success and broader cultures do the same. This has been well understood in the history of public health for uh, at least a century, uh, modern public health. Um, and this insight has been slow to come into palliative care. The other uh, important influence has been the Ottawa Charter for Health Promotion. The idea that health is itself the biggest way in which we can address illness, accident, and disease, um, keeping people healthy and understanding that that aim is embedded in how we construct environments. The link between social environments and physical environments and health and well-being is enshrined in the Ottawa Charter for Health Promotion. And those health promotion ideas are important to informing the public health approach, the new public health approach, if you like, uh, that we see in uh, compassionate communities or public health approaches. The WHO Healthy Cities Movement, uh, most, of you, most of us would know about the World Health Organization Healthy Cities Movement, which began in the 80s. Um, it first started as literally city by city, uh, cities adopting and developing a charter for how they could promote health and well-being, how they could address the kind of um, physical and social morbidities of illness and disease within their environments. Um, they numbered hundreds. Now, I think they've pretty, pretty much leveled off over the last few years because many cities now adopt this without identifying themselves as WHO healthy cities. Most cities understand, most towns understand that they have legislative and policy and cultural responsibilities uh, for health and well-being and tackling and pr the prevention uh, side and the harm reduction side of illness, accidents and uh, disease. So taking that large scale, that kind of macro social approach to health and illness is also part of the model of the macro approach that we see in compassionate cities. The problem with healthy cities in the past has been that the emphasis has been solely on health and disease prevention and harm reduction, solely on health and well-being, and death and dying and end-of-life care has been missing from that narrative uh, from WHO. Uh, and compassionate cities are essentially a corrective to the WHO um, movement. There's also been policy debates within palliative care for many years now about access to palliative care. Uh, who gets access? To, um, at first, it began as geographical discussion. How on earth are we going to get um, palliative care? Uh, how will people in the outback of Australia or way out of the provinces in Canada or in the remote areas of Scotland, how will they get access to good quality palliative care? How will people in Africa or China get access to palliative care? So these debates have started off as geographical issues. They have since morphed into um, greater social um, debates about access, about LGBTQ, about the elderly, about the disabled, um, people with disabilities, um, about people uh, living in rural areas, and about um, people from racial and religious minorities. So that debate is still being hotly contested and, and, and solutions sought. It's an ongoing policy debate. There have also been um, concerns about the continuity of care. How can we ensure that after that, our clinical interventions that 
people go home, how will they continue to get that care? And also, how will the continuity of care go between different professionals? How do you balance the professional symptom science with things like the social and psychological and spiritual care of patients and their families? And then there's the issue of the quality of care. We can't have a palliative care team on every street corner. And yet there is that 95% of time when people are not facing a professional. How do we ensure quality of care when we're not there 24 seven? All of those policy debates play into the hands of a public health answer about communities mobilizing um, to provide or enhance access and to provide that continuity and quality of care. The answer to the continuity and quality of care and access is about communities mobilizing their own assets and power and resources to meet the needs of people living with life-limiting illnesses, life-limiting illnesses, life-threatening um, illnesses, people who are aging, caregiving, and living with loss. So there are the theoretical origins. There are the reasons why the public health approach to palliative care has emerged in the last uh, 20 years or so. Next slide, please. So historically, this um, public health approach began with the um, palliative care unit at La Trobe University in Australia back in the 90s. Um, I should also say that without using um, the terms public health, palliative care, that um, the neighborhood network was also developed in uh, Koshikode in India, in Kerala, under Suresh Kumar. Uh, he was also developing, and his people were developing public health approaches without actually using um, that language. He now uses that language, um, but uh, we were both working on that around the same time in, in the mid-90s. The palliative care unit at La Trobe University in Australia was the first public health palliative care unit um, based in an academic institution. Um, their Health Promoting Palliative Care, which is a book I wrote, uh, was published in 1999, applying the Ottawa Charter to palliative care's mission. That's essentially what that book was about. Whilst there, our unit was able to change Australian state policy. First, in the state that we're in, we were in, which was in Victoria, Australia, and then other states followed. Um, we wrote the federal guidelines for uh, palliative care Australia at that time. There were several Australian demonstration projects and services redesigned. So there were several major palliative care services that decided to include a public health approach and redesign their services to accommodate um, this um, new set of partnerships in providing palliative care services. That was around that same time we wrote, well, I wrote Compassionate Communities, which is the book essentially that um, outlines the major ways in which you can design communities to help each other and cities as well. Later, the Scottish took up the policy recommendations um, that we had adopted in Australia. Uh, I moved to the UK in 2006 and held a number of important talks with the Scottish government around that time. Later, we I developed a partnership with Libby Salno uh, and Suresh Kumar and we developed um, and established the International Palliative Care, Public Health Palliative Care Conference Series, among other things, and decided to join forces with Suresh's practice experiments and my own practice experiments. And we started to develop and lead and encourage those new ones in the UK. Our first British Compassionate Communities appeared in 2010. The first Irish Compassionate Communities appeared in 2012 followed then swiftly by uh, many countries in uh, Western Europe and in Canada and in Taiwan, among other places. Plymouth was the first UK compassionate city. Um, this year, Birmingham has become um, another compassionate city. Uh, and, that, and that's um, quite an achievement when you consider that Birmingham is a city of about a million people. That, that's a very, very large city to come on board. There are several others uh, working for accreditation to become a compassionate city. 
uh, the different civic sectors working together to develop these kinds of policies as well. Uh, I should also say that around the last three years or so, there have been a lot of compassionate communities and some compassionate city experiments in South America, different set of uh, uh, approaches adopted there in different South American countries. The United States saw its first compassionate city in Mankato in Minnesota last year. Um, so we can see that this is still flourishing, still spreading, um, but that's essentially how it started. It is an Australian initiative inspired by the Canadian uh, developments around health promotion and its application to uh, palliative care. Next slide. So it's been about 25 years since we started all of this. Um, and it, it began essentially with the, the palliative care unit at La Trobe University in Australia. We um, worked with palliative care services around their reorientation and policy development. And that was an important part of what we did. We developed public education programs. We made sure we appeared on radio and in television. We had um, newspaper columns. We uh, worked with palliative care services to offer further public education programs, not just about palliative care and its services, but public education programs around death, dying, and uh, grief and bereavement. Compassionate communities were first started around that time, and they've been growing. There are thousands of compassionate communities around the world now, and we have probably about uh, 25 or 30 or so compassionate cities in the world. I, I can't name them all, and there is a number of people now who are trying to get, especially in the UK, accreditation from Compassionate Communities UK, which is a national charity there. Next one, please. So here are some of the highlights. Um, as I said, I, I can't mention them all, but Ottawa in Canada, which has a population of a million, has uh, its own Compassionate City program running there. Interestingly enough, it's run by a group of businessmen. Uh, in Birmingham, the UK, that is a recent one. Again, another very large um, city. Um, and that is run by a coalition of health and social care providers, including charities, uh, working together um, to um, develop public education programs, neighborhood, uh, compassionate neighborhood programs, uh, and to develop civic policies in uh, the different businesses and educational institutions and cultural uh, in the cultural sectors of that city. Inverclyde is the first uh, Scottish compassionate city. Um, that's just outside of Glasgow. For those of you who don't know Inverclyde, that's a population of 80,000 or so. That's the first one in Scotland. Plymouth, UK, I mentioned earlier, has a population of about a quarter million. They were the first um, city um, to develop the Compassionate City uh, program. Nearly all of these cities use what we call a Compassionate City Charter, which is a charter that recommends work over 12 different sectors across the city. So they're being guided by, um, by a set of loose guidelines, if you like. The Compassionate City Charter can be downloaded from our organization, Public Health Palliative Care International. It's free. Um, you might see it also in some of my own publications where it's been reprinted. Uh, and Compassionate Communities UK also provides a free copy of the Compassionate City Charter. And nearly all of these cities use the Compassionate City Charter. They sit down with a group of interested uh, people, uh, people from the faith, faith sector, people from the business sector, from the education sector. They look at the, the chart and the 12 recommendations. They take a few out, they add a few of their own, they make it their own. The Birmingham Compassionate City Charter is not the same as the Ottawa Compassionate City Charter or the Inverclyde one, but they all work off the idea of systematically working across the city and uh, creating a diverse series of policies and practices that are designed to support people in place in their own settings around death, dying and end of life care. The Spanish have been very active. Um, they've got a couple of cities, but they also have dozens of compassionate communities. I, I can't keep up with the Spanish. It's a bit like the Canadians, actually, and the South Americans. 
Um, Koshi Code is one of the oldest compassionate communities. So they were at the very beginning um, in Koshi Code, also known as Kalikat in India. They have 400,000. They work in the northern part of uh, Kerala. Cologne in Germany, uh, the compassionate city there was actually initiated by the palliative care, palliative medicine team in Cologne. Mankato was developed by NGOs, uh, a coalition of health and social care providers in Minnesota, USA. Taipei, interestingly enough, they have about 20 or 30 compassionate communities, um, many of them in the Taipei city, and Taipei itself has now declared itself a compassionate city, has its own charter, has its own uh, published charter. <clears throat> and interestingly, Taipei's compassionate city and communities are led and initiated by uh, hospital physicians, uh, not even palliative care physicians, hospital physicians uh, of different uh, specialities. In Bern, in Switzerland, also a compassionate city program running there, initiated by the palliative medicine team from the University of Bern. Uh, there are many other examples. Uh, instances and examples of these, but here, here just a, a broad cross-section from across Asia and, and Europe and uh, some of the Commonwealth countries. I don't think anybody knows how many compassionate uh, communities there are, but there's certainly hundreds uh, in the UK. To give you one example, uh, in one county uh, in Shropshire, for example, um, there are 70 compassionate communities in the villages and hamlets across uh, Shropshire. These are people who work together um, to provide supports for the people living in those little communities uh, in partnership with the, the local hospice and palliative care service. Next slide, please. So here are some of the professional development highlights. Um, of course, there's Public Health Palliative Care International, and um, that is the, the website if you're interested in visiting that. The, um, PHPCI, as it's known, uh, has a biennial international conference. We've just uh, finished one in Belgium uh, with, uh, I believe, 350 people attended that one. Um, and that was a great success. Before that was one in Australia, and we've had them in um, Canada, of course, and um, in the UK, and Bangladesh, India. I'm not sure where the next one will be, but it's every two years. Uh, Compassionate Communities UK is a registered uh, British charity um, that supports uh, the development of compassionate communities and compassionate cities. Um, and we also provide an accreditation program for cities that want guidance and official recognition uh, for being a compassionate um, city. SAGE publishes the uh, Public Health Palliative Care Journal, known as Palliative Care and Social Practice. Because at the, fundamentally, public health palliative care or public health approaches to palliative care promote a social model of palliative care. And, and that's why the journal is called Palliative Care and Social Practice. Uh, we encourage and we attract quite a lot of um, public health articles, but we also attract a lot of um, articles on pastoral and spiritual care and social work. Uh, and social science. Um, the European Association of Palliative Care has its own public health reference group um, that's been going for several years now. Public Health England and Pallium in Canada have toolkits for people interested in establishing their own um, compassionate communities. Um, Scottish Public Health Networks and the Scottish Partnership for Palliative Care have a, a very large program not just of compassionate community, but also of public education. They specialize in promoting health literacy across Scotland through festival activities, through art competitions, short story competitions, a whole range of uh, public education, death literacy programs are run out of the Scottish Partnership for Palliative Care. They are a public health palliative care um, network and organization. The English NHS, um, had an ambitions policy for palliative care for five years that put compassionate communities as one of six um, recommendations. Uh, and that continues, by the way. Um, but it began in the 2015 2020 policy document uh, that basically put compassionate communities as one of those things that palliative care should strive for in partnership with their local communities. 
And of course, as mentioned in, in uh, the kind introduction for this talk, um, this year saw the first publication of the Oxford textbook of public health palliative care, which is a, a reference work for those who are interested in not only the history, but also some of the theoretical and methodological issues surrounding this particular approach, the debates about evidence, for example, um, some practice examples, all of those kinds of things can be found in uh, our first Oxford textbook on, on this subject. Next one, please. So this movement has been going for about 25 years. Um, it had a very slow start. We did have a lot of resistance and we did have a lot of uh, dissent. Uh, I often don't talk about um, these issues, but I've been encouraged to, uh, by several colleagues over the last few years to, to mention how difficult getting uh, a new approach up and running inside a new approach up and running has been. Um, it, it's surprisingly, it's somewhat surprising that something as simple as a public health approach, which exists in every healthcare speciality except palliative care, would receive such a difficult reception as it did uh, for the first 10 years of its history. When uh, I first <clears throat> tried to publish health promoting palliative care um, and compassionate communities, one of the reviewers recommended that this, this kind of work not be published. Um, and it was a reviewer from Oxford University Press who said that the problem with the public health approach in palliative care is that it's vision. Uh, and really Oxford should not be in the business of publishing vision. As you can see with the Oxford textbook just published, uh, Oxford has uh, changed its view considerably. Uh, and at the same time, um, there's been a major shift in our colleagues' view around the importance of vision in uh, palliative care. And the public health stuff is well and truly established as an academic um, approach now, as well as a clinical one. The other one, of course, is, uh, is I was told to my face several times, oh, we really shouldn't rock the boat. Palliative care is just trying to get on its feet. Um, we still don't have enough doctors. We still don't have enough nurses. Palliative care service, uh, palliative care services and hospice services don't cover most countries geographically, and it's struggling to get uh, international and global coverage. So let's not add to that burden. Um, and we were never we, the public health approach was never designed to add to anyone's burden. It was always about addressing the same things that clinical palliative care were trying to address: access, continuity of care, quality of care. And there are other ways to do this. We were always uh, complementary to the clinical endeavor. But for the first 10 years, we had people who felt that we, we were detracting somehow to the clinical mission. And in some ways, we thought, and many of the people who joined the public health movement within palliative care thought that the so-called palliative care mission was in fact suffering from mission drift, mission drift and that public health was able, a public health approach was able to restore the, the four components of good public, a good palliative care provision, which is the physical, the psychological, the spiritual, and the social. Some people also said that, well, surprisingly enough, we're already doing the public health stuff, and they would cite volunteers. The problem with volunteers is that we've used volunteers in the same way that we use our own colleagues in terms of service provision. We send volunteers out to people's homes to do things, um, but they are providing services. And when those volunteers are not there, those people are still often alone or in other sectors where the volunteers can't be. The thing about family and neighborhood and friends and workplaces and faith groups and sporting clubs and schools is that they're there wherever you are, they are there. So mobilizing that resource is very, very different from mobilizing a volunteer sent out from the local hospice. Other people said, we've been doing public health stuff for years and it's called psychosocial. Well, I've been involved in palliative care for years and I can tell you psychosocial is not community and it's not social. 
The problem with psychosocial is I've been quoted as saying many times, the problem with psychosocial is that it's tended to have been more psycho than social. These things tend to be taking things like gender or eth ethnicity or religion into account in clinical encounters on one-to-one. -one. They are sometimes the use of um, volunteers to address an assortment of psychological and social needs, but they are not themselves designed to create community participation as a civic model of participation. And some people have simply said that public health is not palliative care. I mean, that's like saying that exercising and eating right has nothing to do with cardiology. It's a nonsense. The reality is that public health, as I said before, and I say it again and again, public health has been an important approach. Health promotion has been an important approach. Social marketing policy has been an important part of every medical speciality. And palliative care is not about the last 24 hours of life. It's not even about the last week of life. It's about all of us because we will all die or we will all be involved in caregiving or we'll all live with grief and bereavement. Palliative care like healthcare is everybody's responsibility. And some people have said, well, we'll fund beds, but we won't fund you. You're not gonna do public health <laughs> with our money. Well, that only works so far. <clears throat> that only works so far because at the end of the day, if you don't want to build a hospice on every street corner, because that's what you're going to have to do without a public health approach, and that's what hospitals will have to do if they didn't have a health promotion approach or a prevention and harm reduction approach, you'd have to have an emergency department on every street corner if you decided to ignore or to stop people from wearing bicycle helmets or condoms or seat belts. It's the same in end of life care. So at the end of the day, if you want to save money, you need a public health approach. And then the other thing that people have often said is, where's your evidence? And they said this to me, funnily enough, in the first 10 years of the development of public health approach to palliative care. And the irony was that hospice and palliative care didn't have any of its own evidence for its effectiveness. Funnily enough, Health promotion does have a significant body of evidence of effectiveness. And that evidence can be found in drug and alcohol studies, in child and maternal health, in psychiatry, in, in, in mental health, um, in, a, in a raft of areas. Everywhere where there has been community development, public education, civic policy development, and social supports around health and well-being, there has been strong evidence of effectiveness. There's been meta-analyses and systematic reviews that have repeatedly shown this. We don't have the time today to go into the political economy of health, but public health has always been the poor cousin in the healthcare area, but it has always been an effective cousin. The bulk of the money is often spent on clinical services, and there's a debate about whether or not that's a fair thing. But given that public health has been effective in just about everywhere where it has had a presence in healthcare, there is no reason to think it wouldn't be effective in palliative care. And recent empirical studies have shown it is. Finally, and this is not on this particular slide, but one thing that, that has always been a characteristic of moving around. And I've moved around the world quite a lot since um, we started this public health approach, is that when we started this in one state in Australia, another state said, that'll only work in your state, but in my state, we do things differently until they adopted it. And then another state said that that'll work in those two states, but it won't work in our state because those two states do things very differently from the way we do things until they adopted it. When I went to uh, the UK, one of the first things people said was, you know, that public health stuff works really well in Australia. The Australians really like the public health stuff, but you know, the British don't really do that until the Scots adopted it. And then the English adopted it. 
And then in Western Europe, the Europeans said, you know, the, the British are very open, you know, British and Australia are very open in a way that Europeans are not. And then they started doing it. And then they, the Europeans used to say, you know, this will never work in Asia until they, until they familiarize themselves with Suresh Kumar's neighborhood network. And they saw it in India. And when Taiwan took it up with a vengeance, and now, as we speak, the Japanese are translating compassionate communities for their own consumption. About the only country that didn't give us a hard time was Canada. <laughs> Funnily enough, God bless them. Canada, of course, the home of the Ottawa Charter for Health Promotion. They said, why are we doing this? We should have done this earlier. And so the Canadians were about the only group who never said this wouldn't work here. Um, to some extent, I think that they were a little embarrassed that they didn't invent it. But everywhere else. Uh, we've had this kind of localism, um, this kind of uh, parochialism, and it, there's, that's created problems. But change takes time. And it's been 25 years now, and there's been a lot of people take this up across the world, and we've been doing good work, working in partnership with palliative care. Next slide, please. So for the future, if you're interested in this, I think what I would say about the future is that it's going to be important to get our public health colleagues on board. There's no doubt that the public health approach to palliative care has been a successful and spreading and widely recognized approach with inside, inside palliative care now. That recognition has come for some time, but we are still uh, struggling to get recognition by our public health colleagues. Our public health colleagues still think that death and dying has nothing to do with them. They are dragging their feet. So it's very important that the public health approach to palliative care is taken up by our public health colleagues and research in their practice and policy agenda by our, their colleagues, by their research priorities. And that's very important. And we are working on them as we speak to do those kinds of things. It's important to get corporate and government endorsement. It's important that leaders in government and leaders in business stop thinking about palliative care as something about funding hospices or funding doctors and nurses. Governments have to understand that palliative care is everybody's responsibility and they need to fund trade unions and workplaces and local governments and neighborhoods and cultural services, cultural sector, and schools and faith groups, if you like, there needs to be support for the civic response to end of life care in exactly the same way that governments support healthcare. And community development must sit alongside volunteer provision. Community is more than neighborhood, but it's also more than volunteers. Community is more than neighborhood in the sense that it does involve businesses and schools and local government and faith groups and the social media and the cultural sector and the sporting sector. And it's more than volunteers. Volunteers are important and they will continue to be important because direct services will continue to be important. But they'll be more effective if they work inside a web of other participants within the communities that they visit. And palliative care needs to develop and articulate its public health leadership obligations beyond the clinical agenda. Public health has to be part of our curriculum development in nursing and in medicine and in social work and in allied health. It must be part of our research and policy making efforts. It is not just clinical work that we do. We do everything as a health and social care field and public health is part of that. Every curriculum we develop must be part of that. And we have to start thinking about not just setting up our practices without a partnership with the local community. And a partnership with the local community is not fundraising. It's not drawing on volunteers. It's about working with community on their agendas, on about working and helping them with their policies, because that community will need your help in developing workplace policies. The local Tesco supermarket has a number of employees. What are they doing for their employees when it comes to health crises 
and living with grief and loss or caregiving. We need to help them with that. We need to remember that end of life care is more than service provision. And although we won't necessarily be community development people ourselves, we do need to provide the leadership for that civic sector. We need to remind people about their civic responsibilities in this area. That is the future of palliative care. And that is also the vision of a public health approach to palliative care. Next slide. These are a couple of uh, texts that you might want to read if you need to know more. The one is the report on the Lancet Commission, the other is the Oxford textbook. These can go beyond the words that I've spoken here this morning. Um, and they will help enable you to learn more about why we do these things and what the challenges have been and continue to be for us in palliative care in broadening a public health vision for everyone. Because at the end of the day, as I always say, palliative care, like health care, is everyone's responsibility. And the public health approach to palliative care shows us how we can do that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelleher. It was fascinating. I feel like you're the... Um, Johnny Appleseed of the public health approach in palliative care. Johnny Appleseed. Taking it around the world. And yeah. uh, it's been wonderful to see what's happened in 25 years. And, and the trajectory is so positive. It, it'll hopefully be embracing most communities 25 years down the road or faster. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm inviting questions. You can post them in the Q&A. Um, but I'm going to, some people have already started, so I'm going to read them to you um, so you don't have to worry about what's going on and finding it. Thanks. So um, Terry Weber said, uh, thank you for all of your work and continued passion for the Compassionate Communities Movement, Dr. Kelleher. With all of the Compassionate Community Initiatives that, you're, that are going on and you watching this amazing movement, do you have any words of caution or wisdom based on what you are seeing and feeling. So at least at least one caution and one wisdom would be helpful. <laughs> well, you know, regularly I get colleagues coming up to me and saying, you know, there's a town here or a palliative care service there and they're running uh, their first compassionate communities program. But you know what? I don't think they're doing it quite right. They're not doing it in a participatory way. They're, they're still doing it as a, a kind of a service provision or it's a bit top down or it won't be a sustainable thing. And, you know, shouldn't we sort of, you know, maybe we should correct them. Maybe we should have a meeting with them, you know, whatever. And I always say to people, you know what? We're not after perfection. We're after direction. And it's the spirit of the thing that's the most important thing. The most important thing is that however way we decide to initiate this, it may not be perfect. It doesn't really matter. Every compassionate community you visit and every compassionate city I've ever visited is different from each other. That's the way it should be. We need to approach, I think, a social model of health in a bit more relaxed way than we do, for example, clinical work, uh, which is counterintuitive. But we need to be kind of flexible uh, and, and to understand that in the, at the end of the day, we're, tr we're trying to forge a partnership with people out there, people in the community, the neighbourhoods, the workplaces, the trade unions, the local government. And however way we do that, we'll be good and we'll make mistakes. Uh, somebody once said, uh, wrote a paper about a compassionate community that had failed. And they, <laughs> they asked me what I thought about that. And I said, well, every day a plane falls out of the sky. I'm not going to start, I'm not going to stop flying. It's, it, it's not a comment on the technology. It's just a, a bad luck. It's a bad example. There will be compassionate communities and compassionate cities that will fail. There were healthy cities that failed. And there were healthy communities that failed, healthy workplaces that failed. But overall, the direction is right. And overall, the effort 
to develop them is right. It's what's necessary. The partnership is necessary. So not worry too much about whether or not people are doing it right or whether they're stumbling, or whether they're mistakes, have a sense of humor. We'll push on. Okay, fabulous, thanks. Um, so Lana Trolley um, has, uh, you've got a convert here. So I'm a community developer. I'm nearly finished my master's of social work degree. This talk is in line with my gerontological approach and attitudes towards a future public health care policy and work necessary for social change. Yeah. I'll be following up, and I really appreciate everything that you're talking about. How can I push in that, this direction specifically once I graduate from my master's program? So a new professional launched, what, what would be fantastic first steps or second steps to, to uh, move this field forward? Well, I think, you know, there's a whole variety of jobs that someone with your qualifications will go for. And it's, it, you know, I can't, I can't predict where you might end up, but if you decide you want to work in palliative care, you might go for a, a, a job as a social worker in palliative care with community development skills. Uh, you might go into a, a care home or the care home sector uh, you might end up working in policy. But I always think that you can sell compassionate communities in your job interview as, as a feature. And I think whatever job you go for, you can say to yourself, you know what, you've heard about dementia-friendly communities, you've heard about cancer-friendly communities, we've got something that will cover everything. Compassionate communities is not diagnostically driven community development. We have a community development model for the future that is inclusive, truly inclusive. And you can sell that almost in any job interview you go for. And that will be one of the reasons they'll want to hire you. Great, great points. So Marie says, excellent presentation, thank you. And with appreciation for all of our palliative care um, advocates, there's... Um, let me just see. Uh, <laughs> and Claire says, way to go, Lisa. Lana's, Lisa's other name is Lana. I'll definitely be looking at the toolkit. So in the chat, um, Pallium has come up with a toolkit uh, to help people, to compassionate care uh, promotion. And uh, we you know, want to refer you to that. Um, and then and someone anonymous said, thank you so much for Dr. Kelleher for this amazing and passionate talk. As a first year PhD, PhD student, your energy is inspiring and I can second that for sure. And the resources you have provided will certainly go a long way into helping me to shape my thesis and thinking. You've given me a lot to think about. Thank you for advocating the public health approach for palliative care. My question is, if you had one biggest, most urgent wish for this approach, what would it be? Oh, that's a good question. We'll let you have two if you have to, if that's the problem. Oh, let me get to one first. <laughs> if I had one, if I had one. What? I, I like, I can give you two. I can give you two. One is I would like WHO to, to integrate this into their healthy cities program. Yes, yes. They don't have to have their own compassionate communities program, but I would like them to integrate death, dying and end of life care into their healthy city programs. I'm not precious about ownership of anything, but I think that a healthy cities program that is not inclusive of death, dying and end of life care is seriously a problem in this day and age is seriously a problem. And I would like WHO to recognize the compassionate communities movement or integrate it into their healthy cities program and advocate it. That's an important global initiative. I would like to see that happen. And the second thing is I would like to see countries that have been slow to take it up, um, to take it up, uh, to take it up more, what's the word? vigorously than they currently have. And that's Russia and Africa and large parts of Asia still have not taken this up. There's been more academic interest in it in Asia, 
Um, there's been almost no academic interest in, in, in Russia and Eastern Europe. Um, and we can joke about that under the current circumstances, but um, leaving world events aside for the moment, Russia could be one of those large uh, areas, Russia and China could be one of those large areas that could benefit from a, uh, adopting the public health approach. They themselves have been slow to take up clinical palliative care services, but when they do eventually take that responsibility up, that they take it up with the public health stuff uh, together. Um, they have the advantage that they're at the beginning of these kinds of uh, healthcare innovations. So is that when they start it, let them take it up more holistically than we've done historically. So that would be my two wishes. Okay. I, I agree with you that a WHO adoption would really help spread the movement quickly. and. Uh, yes. Would be fantastic and have you been in talks with the who or um actually or you know it's funny i have a funny story about that i went to see who in um in uh, copenhagen uh who in copenhagen is the headquarters for the healthy cities movement and i went to speak with their leadership at that time and they thought oh, i think uh, this was when uh 2008 so it was very early on in the Compassionate Communities Movement. I took them a book. I gave them uh, Compassionate Cities as a book. They thought it was very quaint. I think they were very polite. And they're probably sitting somewhere in their library, but they haven't done anything with it. Um, so I did talk with them. I think, um, I think the whole problem for WHO is its relationship with palliative care, not just the public health stuff, with palliative care. They've been slow to take up palliative care as a cause within their policy uh, corner. And when they take it up, they take it up in a very medical way. So they're interested in a pain relief, particularly in resource poor countries. They're interested in access. They're interested in service provision. So it's a very conservative, um, take up of, of palliative care. And in some ways, the WHO health promotion mafia doesn't always talk to the medical mafia inside the WHO organization, particularly in Western Europe. And, and you have to understand that WHO in Geneva is, very, is quite different from WHO in Copenhagen and WHO in, in, say, the United States. So it's labyrinthine as an organization, as a policy organization. I have been working with a couple of people in WHO, um, doing some blogs and uh, influencing through EAPC, Public Health Palliative Care Interest Group, um, getting them to shift the language of some of their new policies um, and getting them to think much more about a social rather than a physical and, and psychological model, which they've, you know, the medical and psychological model is the, their, has been traditionally their emphasis. So broadening them out and hoping, encouraging them to use a more social language and, and to look at some of the established public health palliative care literature written by lots of us over the last 10 years. So I have some optimism around that one still. And here's potentially a seed for the 50 plus people attending. If you have got some connections, go forth and, and spread it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And we have time for one the last comment, which will be Jose Pereira. Um, fantastic, Alan. Thank you very much. Alan, to your point regarding how slow government folks have been in seeing the relevance of a public health approach. Back in 2003, when we applied for funding for Pallium Canada, we included your early work on compassionate communities and asked for funding to help, them st to help start them up on small rural communities across Canada but there was no uptake. We did get funding for um, education, which is their LEAP program, but not for our attempts to start compassionate communities. So we did our own work as best we could. Again, when we applied for funding in 2012, the Canadian government again did not see its relevance, but when we went ahead and organized a CC a Compassionate Community Symposium in 2013 to kickstart this important work, Great to see how things are evolving. So I think that note is persistence is, is the key. And thanks for that final comment. Yes. And I'm just going to have a little closing piece to say thank you so much, Professor Kelleher. 
was a well. fascinating presentation. You're a recognized scholar for your truly outstanding work in public health palliative care field and for your continuing contributions to com compassionate communities around the globe. We apologize that we can't physically present you with this uh, certificate of recognition, but hopefully there's a screenshot of that <laughs> as a token of our appreciation and we'll Thanks. ship it to you. A framed version will be ready for presentation at one of the next international public health initiatives or we'll ship it, ship it to you. And we also have sent a modest honorarium which is on its way from the University of Toronto. Thank on behalf of the organizing committee and our hosting organizations, the National Institute for Care of the Elderly, Pallium Canada, and the Institute for Life Course and Aging at the University of Toronto, we'd like to formally thank Professor Kelleher for his timely and thought-provoking um, special lecture. And we'd also like to thank you, the audience, for attending the 2022 edition of the World Hospice and Palliative Day Care Day special lecture and the recording of which will be available shortly via Canadian Virtual Hospice. And we wish you all a great day. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.